In my hand, I have a ball. I just love the game. I've, I've never been a millionaire, but I've lived like one all my life. You know, I made the right decision going to teaching because, you know, the old thing, the old saying, you know, those, those that can do, those that can't teach, you know. I'm not going to go to university. I'm not one for the books. I had no academic passion at all, so to speak. So I decided it was going to be golf. In the 80s, Fulton Allen was one of South Africa's best golfers. He was also one of the most controversial golfers the world has ever seen. Now Fulton's in his 50s, we managed to catch up with Fulton at the Heathrow Golf Club in Orlando, Florida, about four miles from where his home is. Fulton, you came from a, from a family that played golf and loved golf. Is that obviously how you got into the game? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, yes, they loved. My, my late dad and my late dad's brother, Uncle Fordel, and their uncle, Uncle Charlie, they, they did. They played once a week, definitely. It was like either on a Sunday or a Saturday, they had to get out there. If they could get their own way, if it wasn't planting season and it wasn't time for real work, they'd play Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday. So they loved the game. Now, your family were legends in Phil Ewan's crew in the Orange Free State. You were massive farmers there. And obviously, that's where you started to play golf. At what age did you start to play and get interested in the game? I can remember hitting a lot of golf balls at age five. Uh, Uncle Gary used to come down. Uncle Fordel and my dad, they used to, you know, practice on the farm and hit golf balls. And I, I can remember hitting golf balls. And I kind of begged enough between age five and say nine for them to eventually take me to the golf course. So it, it had to be somewhere between eight and nine where I actually went to the golf course to play on the golf course with them. And at what stage did you decide that golf was what you wanted to make your career? Hazy, I think it was when, when I was kind of like in the army. I, I was in the army. I had rheumatic fever, which was a problem in those days. They didn't want you to go to the army if you had rheumatic fever. And they found out, you know, that I had rheumatic fever after I'd enrolled and everything. So they asked me, you know, listen, it would be better for you not to be in the army. So uh, right then and then I decided, well, I'm not going to go to university. I'm not one for the books. I had no academic passion at all, so to speak. So I decided it was going to be golf. Now your brother, your brother followed in your father's footsteps as a farmer. Was there, uh, was there a little bit of disappointment that you didn't do that? I guess in a way that it wasn't disappointment as such. But, uh, you know, for my late dad, he was so fantastic. Whatever we wanted to do, he would encourage us to do it to the best of our ability. That was what he was all about. Uh, so I don't know if I can say he was disappointed. It was just more of a concern that maybe, you know, there wouldn't be anybody to help out when he got older. That was probably the thoughts that he had at the time. If a, if a, a youngster has a father that's famous in golf, mm. it's, there's a lot of pressure on him. Yeah. Obviously, coming from a father like your father and your uncle, who were hugely successful farmers, did you find that added to the pressure of you in the, golf, in the golfing scene? to do well? It was more added to the pressure of being a success in life than as to, uh, opposed to the fact that I was, uh, you know, I chose golf. So it was an added pressure for me to do well at golf because being a success was something that was like indoctrinated into us from, ch from childhood, that you had to work hard, be disciplined, because that's how they became successful. You know, farming hours were, I mean, there were times where they, were, they would go through the night for weeks on end, you know. So, yes, it was. It was a little bit of a, a, a concern of mine that if I failed, I really would have let them down. Yeah. You love practicing that? Yes, I did. I did because, you know, when we grew up, Dale, we, we learned with our eyes. I used to watch you. I used to watch Yui, you, Gary Player, everybody that I could steal something from with my eyes. 
That's how we learned. So you'd go to the practice range, I'd put you in my thoughts and I'd try and hit a draw and I'd visualize how Dale does it. And that's how I learned to play the game, was through visualization. I never knew anything about, you know, the basic, uh, uh, the fundamentals I had, but you know, all the little intricate details that they use today that you can speak of. I mean, in my opinion, it's all ridiculous because I just think the game, the simplicity of the game is what makes it so interesting because it's so simple. There's a golf ball, there's a golf club, there's a hole. Hit it and count. We don't subtract, we just add. So the simplicity of it is, is what makes it so much of a challenge for me. When you turn professional, um, you played obviously a lot in South Africa, you started to have success in South Africa. You played a little bit in Europe, but your eyes were always on America, weren't they? Yes, definitely. I always had my eyes over here. You know, uh, listening to Gary when he came home and speaking to my dad and my uncle and talking about America and how well he played and watching him, you know, it, it was like, this is the arena. The golfing arena of the world is the United States. I've got to get there if I want to be number one. And that's where I set my goals. But the one thing, in, even in those early days, mm. is there was never short, uh, there was never short of a uh, bit of controversy around Fulton Allen. <laughs> well, that's me, AZ. I wear it on my sleeve. You, you know, uh, some people like me and some people don't like me. And I guess I, I, I think it's that way for most people. I just never could be, I never could shut up if I felt like I had to say something. You know, I, I just, it out. I, I regretted it later, but I said it at the time, whatever it was, and I guess it created a lot of controversy sometimes, and other times people loved it. So, that any any particular thing that happened in those days, in those early days, that you that you your mind can go back to and you can say, "Gee, oh, there's yes. something I really wish I hadn't done." Yeah, well, I don't know if I was. I'll probably do it again. We were playing at Port Elizabeth. We were playing Humewood. The greens were seriously fairways they weren't really greens and <clears throat> i was playing the practice round and i figured out during the course of the practice round that i was putting better with my two iron because it had uh, 18 degrees aloft and my putter only had like four degrees or three degrees aloft at the time so i started putting with my two iron and lo and behold the word got out that alum's chipping on the greens the next minute the superintendent comes to the golf course, he's got a gun and he's threatening to shoot me if I say, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was ridiculous. Anyway, we go to the first round. <laughs> I'm five under par through eight holes playing humor in the first round, putting with a two iron. And uh, Jimmy Hempel got wind of the fact that I, I was putting with a two iron. So he came up and I was playing with Bobby Lincoln at the time and Bobby Lincoln, kind of like pulled Jimmy aside and said, you better not say a word to him, he's five under par. Just leave him alone. So he never said anything. But that's crazy stuff. I mean, uh, you know, I don't regret it. I mean, I loved putting with a two iron because I was making putts. But <laughs> you actually won I the tournament. What I, yes, I you won the tournament. Yeah, I regret what I said about the greens, you know, that no self-respecting cow would even graze on them. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Brains, I think, was involved in that as well because he tells that story and says that he came out to watch you. And uh, the first hole that he watched you, pl you putt on, he said, you got up and you hold it from 10 feet. So he thought, I better not say anything. And the next hole you hold it from 12 feet, I thought I better not say anything. The third hole you hold a putt, and he went back to the clubhouse and said to the greenkeeper, he said, what can I say? I watched him play three holes, he birdied all three of them. <laughs> but um, are there any other instances that, you, that your mind goes back to that you really, you know, when you look back now, you really regret what, what happened? You know, on the golf course, I, I regret blowing up sometimes. You know, my, my, my level of expectation, I always expected myself to do so well. And there are times where I may have used some choice words and, and didn't pay attention to who was actually standing around. And those are the times that I regret. You know, I, 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 I know I have used some bad language in front of ladies and maybe possibly in front of children without intentionally trying to make them feel bad, but just being, you know, explosive at the time and not being smart enough and not being, you know, disciplined enough, so to speak, to not do that and behave that way. Those are the regrets that I do have. But again, interesting that you are so disciplined in your practice. 
It's incredible. And yet, and yet you weren't disciplined sometimes in your behavior. It's, a, it's a still to this day, it, it's a puzzling thing for me. How I can do certain things, like if I go fishing, I have got more patience fishing than I could possibly have doing anything. But you get me on the golf course and there's slow play on the golf course, I go ballistic. I cannot handle it. I was going to ask you, uh, you know, if you look at a great, the true greats of golf. Yeah. You know, when I say great, I'm talking about the Nicholases, the Watsons, the players. Yes. They've got everything. Yes. Okay. Yes. Would you say that perhaps the one thing that you lacked was patience on the golf? Absolutely. That cost me many, many tournaments. There's no question in my mind. Let's go back to the tournaments that you that you won. You came over to America. You got your tour card, and you and you won the World Series of Golf. Yes, it actually started off at Houston. I, I came here in 86. I managed to finish second at the World Series the first time I played it. And in those days, I, by finishing second, I got enough money to keep my tour card. Can you believe it? Just one tournament, and I kept my tour card for the following year. So I came back the following year, and I was going to stay full time. So I then managed to finish in the top 125 for the next two years. And then the following year, 1991, I didn't play well. I started having issues with my game and I just wasn't quite settled down and came towards the end of the year and I hadn't had enough, the last tournament and I didn't have enough money to keep my card. I needed to finish in the top three and that was at Houston which was called the Mulligan Tournament because in 1991 we would have played Houston sort of like mid-July uh, or end of June somewhere and then they had this massive flood come through and they cancelled the whole golf tournament because of the rain and then they decided to put it on right at the end of the year you know, after all the tournaments had been played. And we came back and I was there, I had to finish in the top three to keep my card. And lo and behold, I managed to shoot 66 in the last round and win the tournament. So I went from a 7 o'clock tea time at Greenleaf to a 1 o'clock tea time at Augusta. So it just goes to show how your life can change. And I kept my card, so I had all these arrangements about going back to South Africa, losing my card and, you know, selling my home over here and everything just to get back to South Africa. And there it was, boom, won the tournament. And, you know, that's just really, there was a big deciding point in my life. So, you know, for, for 10 or 15 years, I mean, you did very well playing golf in America. Yeah, I did. I, I won't say I did as well as I, I believe I could have. I had a lot of baggage in my mind, and like I said, I wasn't the most patient person. So I couldn't control that aspect of the game. The ability was always there. I really did. I, I worked hard on, on being able to play just about every single shot that you could possibly need out on the golf course to try and score, you know, to not drop a shot, so to speak. Uh, Patience-wise, I lacked, so I, I performed okay, but I didn't perform as well as I know I really could have. And uh, I was very fortunate to win the World Series of Golf at the time that I did, because it gave me that 10-year exemption, which, you know, that, that's like huge, because now you've got a job. Right, right. You know, you're not wondering next year, what am I going to be doing next year, what am I going to... And that, uh, that made a big, big difference in my life. Another, another very important tournament for you, of course, was the, the uh, Ned Bank Golf Challenge. Oh, yeah. Also controversial. Oh, very right? special, yeah. And a lovely story yeah. where you were giving uh, uh, Jeff Hawks a ride <laughs> up to, up to Palabora. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, that was, <laughs> you know, it's, it's incredible. That was quite funny. And I just won, I just won down in Stellenbosch, the Twe Jonge Zellen. You remember? We played the South African Masters there. And I just won the tournament and then I'd been given an invite from Sun City at the time to play in the Million Dollar. And if you look back, Blandy had had the most fantastic year in Europe. He'd finished fourth on the money list in Europe. He'd won two tournaments in Europe. He really had a fantastic year. And uh, they ended up inviting me and not Blandy to the million dollar. Now, obviously, you know, it's luck of the draw. They thought it was better for me to play for their tournament. And I accepted. I'm not going to say no. But I picked Jeff Hawks up to give him a ride to Palabora. And I'm sitting in the car and we're driving to Palabora. And all I hear for 20 minutes is how much Blandy deserved the invite over and above me. And I agree. I said, you know, you're right. But... When it got to where he turned around and told me, you know, I think you should turn around and tell them that 
you sh you don't want to play. John Bland's gonna should go in, and I'm thinking, here's a man here telling me now I must turn down the opportunity of winning a million dollars and getting at that stage fifty thousand dollars just for finishing Stone last. I'm a, I should just turn this down and give it to John Bland. And I'm like, yeah. And then I kind of like said, Jeff, I said I don't think that's a good idea for me to. Do. I said I got no say in who gets the invite. They invited me. I'm not going to turn them down. Yeah, but you should give this to Bland. You should do the right thing. And I said, look, I've had about enough of this for 25 minutes. All I heard was how I should have turned down the invite and given it to John Bland. So fortunately, I didn't smack him. I just <laughs> pulled over. <laughs> I just pulled over at, uh, what's that town? Middle, uh, Middleburg. Bank, uh, that, uh, Middleburg, that, that, on the, on the. Ultra on, City. There you go. Michelle I Ultra pulled City. over there. I said, I needed some gas. I said, why don't you get some stuff out of the out of the, the shop over there, get us a couple of Cokes and stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna fill up with gas. So he got out the car, he went into the shop to get some Cokes. I took all his luggage out of the car. I put it down next to the gas pump over there. I closed the trunk and I got in the car and I went. I left him there, I couldn't, <laughs> I, I couldn't do, I could not handle it anymore, you know? So, but the nice thing about this story is Michael Green pulls in behind me. Who's a great friend of yours. Who's a great friend of mine. And he sees Jeff Hawke standing over there and he says, but what happened? I thought you were riding with Fawlty. And Jeff said, yeah, he's left me over here. So he asked Michael for a ride and Michael said, no. <laughs> Shame old Hawke, he got a bad day. It was a bad day for Jeff Hawke. <laughs> it was a bad day for Jeff. <laughs>